For many people in the world, emergency medicine is the only kind of health care they receive, and they receive it under dire circumstances. What might surprise you is how alike it is, whether you're in downtown Toronto or East Africa. That's according to Dr. James Muscolic, author of Life on the Ground Floor, Letters from the Edge of Emergency Medicine. He's an emergency room physician at St. Michael's Hospital in Toronto and also works in Ethiopia with Addis Ababa University to train emergency medicine physicians. Welcome, doctor. Thank you. It's nice to have you here. Glad to be here. Your book tells stories from the emergency room in St. Mike's here in Toronto um, and also in Addis Ababa in Ethiopia. What brought you to Ethiopia in the first place? You know, I just left Sudan. I did my first mission with uh, Doctors Without Borders, Médecins Sans Frontières. And you wrote a book about it, Six Months in Sudan? I did, mm -hmm. yeah. And, you know, I'd waited my whole life, my whole medical life, mm -hmm. to work with that organization. When I was in medical school, I knew what kind of doctor I wanted to be. Was that, was that kind of doctor? What kind of doctor is that? You know, a play, uh, someone who's able to go where, to where the sick people are. Mm -hmm. And I had, was lucky because I had a formative experience in medical school. I did an elective in the public system in Chile, in, the, in, in you know, a, a, a relatively low-income country. And I saw how much sickness was embedded in poverty, meaning I would go to rounds in Calgary, where I trained, mm -hmm. and I would see people who were you know, ill, but nothing prepared me for how sick people were in other places. So I thought, well, as I'm training to become a doctor mm -hmm. and being taught that I should take care of the sick people no matter what time of day, um, I thought that if the, sick, the sickest people seemed elsewhere, well, perhaps I should go to them. And so I trained to be an emergency doctor for a couple different reasons. It gave me the skills to work in places with modest resources. You knew a little bit about everything. Mm -hmm. And uh, you, I didn't have a patient practice, so I could travel and, and, and do that kind of work that I, I very much felt was part of the reason why mm -hmm. I was in medicine. And MSF, or Doctors Without Borders, was the organization that really represented for me the apex of that type of care. Mm -hmm. You know, they would go in conflict zones, they would be the first in and last out in disaster areas. So I very much was waiting to go away with them and, you know, that old adage, be careful what you wish for, mm -hmm. because you, very, you will get it. Mm -hmm. It turned out to be true. I went to Sudan and, you know, what happened there, you know, it's, I capture it in my book, but the default world switched. So what became normal, this, my home became- Became strange. Became strange. What became normal was seeing how much people suffer, mm -hmm. you know, a lack of food, a lack of freedom in, in, in conflict areas. And it was hard to have that relationship with my home again in the same way. So it's often the case that people return to mm -hmm. what now seems to be the priority. So that was true for me. And as I was deciding when to go next, mm -hmm. what to do, how to, how to engage with that world, I got a phone call mm -hmm. from the then director of emergency medicine in Toronto saying, I've heard that Ethiopia is looking to start its own version of emergency medicine. They want a training program. They need the whole thing from nurses to what to have in the pharmacy. Do you want to do it? And you can't really fight what looked like the, the circumstances that created a situation like Sudan. You can't really fight war with, with, with weapons. That's like trying to get something clean with more dirt. So what, what can I do is perhaps work in, in a more subtle way mm -hmm. to create a system of emergency in Ethiopia or near, but nearby Sudan, and maybe one day take that idea and with the help of my Ethiopian take colleagues, it take it to Sudan. Yeah. How, how much time so, do you spend in Ethiopia? It depends. It works out to about six months every couple of years, mm -hmm. I suppose. And That's, when you first went there, what was the situation like when you started this uh, hospital, the emergency room? You no know, tin room, people on the floor, no one at the triage desk, no people particularly, nurses or doctors, trained in the medicine that I knew. Mm -hmm. One person who saw how important it was to start this type of medicine, you know, who, who understood that if you care for the most vulnerable people in a population, mm -hmm. you're more likely to transform your economic situation than any other way. He saw that to be true. Who was that? His name's Aklilu. 
Dr. Ekli Liu. He's my, uh, a colleague and friend of mine who still very much is a part of this, this, this work in Ethiopia. Mm -hmm. And um, it was just him and me walking through the ER and imagining what it could look like. You wrote that medical students view emergency medicine differently in Addis um, compared to Toronto. How so? I think it's probably changing, but the idea that you would choose to work with this patient population, the abjectly poor, in a difficult, stressful situation, why, why would anyone choose that mm -hmm. when you could maybe specialize in cardiology, do work with people who have money, who can afford to pay you a living wage? And, and when you have normal hours? You have normal hours. Mm -hmm. You're not be around the constant cycle of dying and suffering and pain and people screaming. It's a strange decision to work in this, that job in any place, but in Ethiopia in particular. I mean, uh, this might sound a bit, you know, um, when you watch TV, like, it seems like emergency rooms in shows like Grey's Anatomy are very romanticized, that everybody wants to be in the ER. Um, isn't that the way it is here? Yeah, that really helps a lot, actually. <laughs> It's been it's been one of the great you know uh, advocacies <laughs> for the specialty. <laughs> sure, I'm waiting for the Ethiopian version actually, and uh, uh, hopefully it's on its way. Um, you describe the emergency room as the great equalizer, where money can't help you jump the queue, and the sickest person always comes first. From your experience, that hold, does that hold true um, around the world? It does, yeah, it does in the public system, it does in my hospital. And what I'm so proud of is being able to go to Ethiopia and working in the public system there. As a Canadian, mm -hmm. I can, it, it's, it's unnatural for me, and it, it may be natural for an American, but it's unnatural for me to ask someone how much money they have and determine what type of care they get. The sad truth of it is in Ethiopia, because a lot of the money comes from an individual's pocket, that we have to be mindful of the true, the, how elaborate we are with our investigations and treatment. But I'm so genuinely inspired because even if someone comes in with nothing, the Ethiopians will find a way to get them what they need. And, mm -hmm. and it's remarkable. Um, so, you know, you still do carry in the ER, no matter where you go, you carry so their subtle biases. Right, so you'll, in, in America, if you look at some of the research, you'll see that you know, African-American kids mm -hmm. who have appendicitis get less pain relief than, than uh, uh, non-African-American patients, which is astounding, mm -hmm. right? So there's these subtle biases that exist. You know, elderly people typically get less, uh, uh, less pain medicines, for instance, as well, too. So there's this, but economics is not one of them. Mm -hmm. But you also write in, um, like in Ethiopia, the people who are in the emergency rooms are mostly poor people. Uh, in this case, they are, because it's a public hospital. Mm -hmm. So there's a two-tiered system in Ethiopia. If you have money, you can access private, private system. It's not the same in Canada, as you know. But uh, in the people who turn to us in Addis Ababa have nowhere else to go. And what's great mm -hmm. is I can say with absolute confidence, it's the best emergency system in the country. You described the experience of treating an old woman who was hit crossing the road. Um, how you put in a ton of resources to try to save her even though she died six hours later. Here's what you wrote. You are able to do that at home because you don't see the dollars. Here it is clear where each one comes from because it is pulled creased and tattered from some worried mother's pocket. It makes the math of what a life is worth very clear. Everything to those who love you. Once you see through the lie that the worth of a person's life depends on where they are born or how close to money, you never go back to being the same person. How did that change you? You know, great sadness follows that understanding. You know, still there with me because you see the inequity and the discrepancy and it's, it's painful because you can see how much energy is wasted on perpetuating that myth. And you know, I think what is I've understood from from wrestling with that 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 conflict is that I must work on it in myself. Mm -hmm. That's where it all comes from. So how can I make sure that I go into these situations with as little bias, as little undeclared bias as mm -hmm. possible, just so I can even recognize it in subtle forms as it exists in the world, mm -hmm. and 
So in, in that way, it's lucky because the, the transformation is possible. First, you get to work on yourself. And then you can then take on these larger problems, even though you're never going to see the end of them in our short lifespan. But um, that, that realization is, uh, is a true one, and, and it's difficult to wrestle with, with how, how much suffering is embedded in it. You mentioned determination. Um, has working in Addis made you a better doctor, or even in Sudan? A better person. And I think that's what makes a person a better doctor or a better engineer. You know, how, how much can you care about what your actions bring into the world? Mm -hmm. You know, how, how honest can you be with your patients about where you're at, mm -hmm. about what you hope to accomplish? And what is really uh, helpful is the exquisite feedback that, the subtle exquisite feedback you get at all times about. From whom? From just the universe, mm -hmm. the reflection back from people who you value, you know, your friends and the love that's reflected back to you. Um, how when you stay close to, you know, the deeper motivations, um, your life just works out. It may not be, you may not get everything you ask for. You may not be able to say, I want to be a billionaire and have that manifest, but you can certainly sleep easy mm -hmm. and which is kind of the greatest gift. Well, in the book, um, you know, your friends, you write that some of your friends ask you, you know, when are you going to settle down? And because they have this idea, I guess, if you're here, it's um, you are settled down and you're happier because you're making more money. You don't have to go into these so-called conflict zones. Um, how does that make you feel? I think at some point you wonder how your life's going to turn out. Mm -hmm. And um, we can imagine all the different ways that it's going to be. And then one day you're 43. And you realize, well, this is this is this is it. Mm -hmm. And you know, I think that I again, I don't know. I can't say for certainty how things are going to develop in the future for me, but very much this is where my motivation lies. And what the greatest gift has been for me, you know, you leave a place like with MSF, and I intend to work for them again because I I really value their mission. But you leave with this bit of a sinking feeling, like, so now what? Especially somewhere like Sudan, now what? Mm -hmm. I go back home, and what next? But now I've got this, some friends in Ethiopia, and they're the what? And they're gonna take this you know, idea, that's not even mine, I just, as a cop, I borrowed it, mm -hmm. and it's not mine. But they're gonna take it, and they're gonna put it into new arenas, and reach people, I, I can't even imagine where it's going to go. Transference of knowledge. I think so, you know, yeah. and, and, and motivation, mm -hmm. and, and true connection. You know, as a time, at a time where walls seem to matter more than ever before, to have the relationship mm -hmm. that I've been able to be part of with my friends and colleagues in Ethiopia is just the antidote to all that stuff. I'd like to read another passage from your book. Uh, you write, a teacher in medical school insisted that anyone I admitted to hospital should have all their drugs stopped so we could reintroduce the fewest a body needed one at a time. Good medicine, she said, was getting out of its way as much as possible. From her, I learned the most productive question I ask in the ER when someone tells me they feel sick. What have we done to you? How much does overmedication contribute to the numbers of people you see in Toronto in the ER? No, I think that there's, there's good evidence on this. And I think they would say adverse drug events or adverse drug reactions between 2 and 5%. And now that skews quite heavily if you look at elderly population when people are on a lot of different drugs. You know, I, the body is this great self-healing thing. You know, I did this in my, when I studied physiology in my first degree. I took a course called Psychoneuroendoimmunology. And the final exam was one question. It said, everything does everything and is produced everywhere. Explain. And you had mm -hmm. three hours to do it. And what you needed to explain during those three hours was how a hair cell could turn into a white blood cell. How all of these cells in our body, the trillions of cells, are capable of doing all of these different things, yet we're held in this particular shape. Mm -hmm. And if you've ever watched a cut heal, it just sews itself back together. It already knows what to do as soon as it happens. So I'm a big believer in the self-healing nature of this, the process that is alive in us. And you know, my approach to medicine is very subtle. The body is very subtle. And I, I think too often 
because we're asked to see so many people in such short periods of time, Western medicine shoots itself in the foot in a way. We're more likely to prescribe antibiotics for a person who comes in with a common cold because we're not able to have the discussion and explain to them how a virus works and how these antibiotics aren't useful. So in order to make money, in order to avoid difficult discussions, we are more likely to prescribe something. And at the same time, we're really encouraged to do that by the pharmaceutical industry. Please give them our drugs. We'll show you how they work, mm -hmm. how, how little they, they work a little bit. That's another thing that I was surprised to read. Yeah. That most of the medicine doesn't really do anything. Yeah, you know, it, and I don't want to be polemic and say, like, that's not, mm -hmm. you know, get it, only get out of the body's way. They're de and I know the motivations of a lot of my colleagues and friends are, are to really, truly help the person in front of them as best they can. But um, a lot of the time it is uh, really being patient with the body understanding how to to support that natural process as much as as you can um, and sometimes the unexciting vice advice is you need healthy relationships mm -hmm. you need to be care, take care of yourself a little bit more mm -hmm. you need to watch what you eat that suits you the best and Rest. stay off uh, Dr. Google. Yeah, <laughs> that's very true, yeah. Uh, you mentioned uh, your approach to medicine. What is your approach to medicine? Um, I think that obviously I understand my job is to address the person's needs in front of me as completely as I'm able. Mm -hmm. But I think that it is to t ask successive questions until I understand exactly where the person is there. Sometimes it's, yeah, I broke my leg, in which case, sure, I'll sort you out with that. But other times it's a little bit more subtle. They, you know, say they come in with chest pain, for instance. It's very common to have a young person come in and have chest pain that's not cardiac. But then I need to ask questions like, how, how are things at home? Are we sleeping well? And so I think that my motivation comes, the strength and the power of Western medicine comes from that, the, the sanctified doctor-patient relationship where someone can tell me their deepest secrets. And so for my job is to cultivate that space so they can trust me and we can have that relationship in their best interest. I'd like to read another passage from your book about relationships. <laughs> um, we don't develop relationships with patients, claim that we prefer it that way. We dive deep, straight, unapologetically, unsentimentally into a person's worst fears Ask them about sex, drugs, who's hurting them, why they're hurting themselves. We look in their eyes, watch them cry, put needles into their veins until they're plump with water, dab blood from their cervixes, nor their bodies more intimately than they ever will. When the new shift comes in, we go home and try to live in ours. What kind of toll has it taken on you working in the emergency room all these years? I don't know. You know, this is my life. Mm -hmm. You know, I... I go to work every day and I see people who are hurt and I see people who die and I watch families mourn and I wouldn't change it if I could. Is it tough to go home though? Because in the book you mentioned that you're dealing with people on their, the worst day of their life in some cases and then you go home. I, I consider it a great gift to me that mm -hmm. I have this insight. You know, I, I, I maybe sometimes it would have helped me if I would have been distanced from that difficult part of, of human existence, so I could have maybe had a bit more frivolity in my life. But I do think that wrestling with these essential questions about how to age, how to face illness, mm -hmm. one day how to die, is not a bummer. Because the answer that comes back is, well, well how, how then do I want to live in the meantime? And so I get that, <laughs> that adjustment, mm -hmm. that, that spiritual adjustment when I, go into the, in, when I go into my day job, night job, evening job, weekend job. <laughs> Everyday job. <laughs> Everyday job, yeah. Um, you wrote that people who work in the ER burn out faster than any other types of physicians. Do you train the medical students to detach themselves? No, uh, to uh, learn how to attach themselves. I would say that would be what I've learned um, would be to really engage with mm -hmm. that, that person in front of you in a way that matters, in a way that's healthy. 
You can be young, get do it in an unhealthy way. Mm -hmm. So what I try to show is how to be, do he be healthy about it. And what that looks like to me is when I see a person, I say to them, okay, you know, in, 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 in deliberate ways or in subtle mm -hmm. ways, we're now in a relationship, me and you. My job is to work in your best interest with as little bias as possible and I can, as I can bring into this encounter. Mm -hmm. And I can do that and I have great resources to bear. Your job is to take responsibility for your own health. Mm -hmm. And if we're able to do that, each of us is able to do our job, then this can be the catalyze you, know, you to, to better days. Mm -hmm. If not, if you're not able to take responsibility for yourself, no matter how much energy I pour into this relationship, it's not gonna work out. You dedicate your book to Ian, and you mention her once or twice in the book. Mm -hmm. Who is she? Um, Ian is a, uh, she was a six month old girl who was left in the hospital that I just arrived to in, in Sudan. Mm -hmm. And uh, she was admitted there because she had, as it was an orphan. So I watched her learn how to walk, I watched her learn how to talk, and then I'd really considered adopting her because I was kind of hoping that no one would assume care of her because I'd grown, you know, attached. And I'd made this decision in my mind, okay, well, that's not the right thing to do. The right thing to do is to find how the community would normal, normally handle this type of situation and support that as much as I can. Mm -hmm. So that's the decision I made. I left Sudan as the war roared through that place. The town was burned down and I lost track of her. I was still looking. Mm -hmm. um, I have been close a couple times, but I thought my intention the intention that informs my first book and this book mm -hmm. is to make a play. If I can make a place safe enough for Ian or someone like her to go to medical school in Juba to learn how to do the medicine that is needed in that place, mm -hmm. that would be the right direction for me to continue to, to focus my energies. But I'm assuming that you've met lots of people, um, treated lots of children. Why did she have such an impact on you? You know, I, I think at one point I thought, well, maybe this is my attempt to make sense of a situation that's out of control. So I'm going to sublimate all of these complex emotions and, and I'm going to assign it to a particular individual because that's easier for me to relate to. Mm -hmm. But I don't think that was it. I just think that, you know, love happens that way sometimes and, and, and especially between, you know, someone who has the capacity to care for a vulnerable child, you know, that's how those bonds form. So that's where I'm at now. You also write about your grandfather. How's he doing? He's well, yeah. And he's very much the man he was as I knew him as a kid. His body is slowly falling away. What impact has that had on you, watching him? He has such a healthy relationship to living and dying. Mm -hmm. You know, he was a trapper and he went to school through grade eight. And he spent his whole life living in that flux of, you know, trapping animals, hunting them, living off from the land, fishing. So he knows the cycle of life very well. He understands he it. He understands it. Um, you've said uh, to the CBC that writing your last book, Six Months in Sudan, saved you. How so? I think the tendency is when you're hurt or when you're struggling with, you know, difficult, questions is to put off that work by piling more on top of it. So that would mean, you know, you could see that in the ER. If you're burning out, you, in my experience, you can start to take on more shifts because you're, don't wanna, you don't want to step back and see, take a deep look inside yourself. Mm -hmm. So what I was asked to do when I got back from Sudan, and what was, you know, write a book about it, and what's very typical for many people who have that experience is to head right back on the road because this place feels strange now. Mm -hmm. So you wanna go back to people who understand what you're talking about. But you neglect the fact that you kinda of owe it to the world to sort your stuff out. You owe it to the world to be well. You need to untangle all of, the world doesn't need another wounded person mm -hmm. traipsing around the world pretending to help people. You owe it to yourself to be well. So what happened when I was forced to look back at that difficult experience and then recount it as I wrestled with some of those, those uh, uh, more difficult aspects of it. Mm -hmm. And if I not make sense of it, at least acknowledged it and was honest to myself about it. 
So then when I went out with MSF again next, I committed to being better about it, to not, not trying to, to um, overcompensate by seeing how much I could endure and developing a healthier relationship with the work. And I think if I hadn't done that, it's highly likely I would have got sick. Become an when alcoholic. you say endure, like what you saw in the field? Right. Yeah. Um, that was six months, life on the ground. What impact has that had on your life? The book itself? Yes. Um, I think I've been able to engage my, a different community of people. So say the emergency doctors, colleagues, people who are familiar with at least the ERs that I evoke, the Canadian ERs that I evoke. So I think I've made the spirit of the emergency room less ex and, or less exotic than it seemed with MSF. MSF seems like an exotic, exciting, adventurous thing. Well, the emergency room, well, there's one on, in every small town, isn't there? So I think that the entry point for a lot of people now in through the ER, where I take people kind of gently introduce them to the ER in Canada before I take them to Ethiopia, gives a chance to people to, to take away some of the, the mystique because the actual, um, the activity of the emergency room is the same whether you're in downtown Toronto or whether you're in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia. Thank you so much for being here. My pleasure. And for the work that you do. Thank you. Help TVO create a better world through the power of learning. Visit TVO.org and make a tax-deductible donation today.